In 2014, National Geographic put out 9:10, The Final Hours, which is intended to be a moment-by-moment -moment dissection of the day before 9-11 entwined with the day's activities of the terrorists plotting the attacks, but it does provide some potential clues in the reports of Canadian connections with additional conspirators covered up. For the first time in 9-11 documentary filmmaking, National Geographic with 9-10 The Final Hours go the extra lengths of briefly interviewing actual people in Portland, Maine who had either encountered or witnessed Atta and Alamari's presence there, such as the employees at the pizzeria, hotel, travelers and employees at Jetport. Although the people who worked at the hotel and pizzeria didn't want to show themselves on camera still in 2014, in the New York Post article dated October 12th, 2001, final hours of hijack monster, he waited until last minute to buy box cutters. There were reports the two were sighted at two nearby restaurants, a pizza hut and a weather vane seafood restaurant between 7 and 8.30 p.m. Workers at the pizza hut were still jumpy. We've got to try to run a business here, the restaurant's manager said. A waitress at Weathervane said two Middle Eastern looking men, one who resembled Atta, dined at the restaurant that night and asked for the details of how the fish and chicken were cooked. Sue Paquette, a spokesman for Weathervane, said the two men may have been part of a group of five Muslim men, wearing traditional Middle Eastern dress, including turbans, who dined at the restaurant two nights before on Saturday. The group of five men made an effort to be gregarious and friendly, she said. Unfortunately, the staff haven't been able to say for sure whether any of the men were involved in the hijack, she said. Besides the aforementioned regarding Banger, Maine and other details within the New York Post article, lots of Portland, Maine locals remember seeing Atta several times in the coming months and weeks before the attacks, while employees at the establishments that serviced the hijackers previously were told by feds to be quiet about what they saw. But that group of five Middle Eastern men potentially sounds as this could be some of the additional or leftover suspects already coming in from Canada a week prior or within the days right before the attacks by ferries or border crossings, and that they could be remainders who didn't take the feeder plane from Bangor Airport, but traveled from there to preset themselves in Portland, Maine days before the attacks, rendezvousing with Atta and Alamari. In a September 9, 2003 article, It's Been a Loss of a Lifetime by Josie Hong, writer for Portland Press Herald, covers the story of the Comfort Inn general manager, Laura R. Whale, and that the consequence of troubles and turmoils from September 11th personally affecting her life, and that she had some very interesting questions regarding the FBI's actions on tracking down Atta and Alamari. Two years after the attack, Whale felt like she was a victim of the terrorists. She believes her connection to September 11th and the stress of dealing with the federal investigators, the national media, and her company sent her life into a tailspin. In the article, it states that she sounds impatient, agitated, that her story veers off into conspiracy theories? How did government agents know to storm the Comfort Inn only hours after the Twin Towers fell? Why did the FBI release surveillance video of Atta and Alamari at various locations in South Portland, but not the lobby of the Comfort Inn? What she wonders is on that tape. And what we also wonder is whether there were additional suspects accompanying Atta and Alamari until the next morning departing from Jetport as we should also wonder if there was more to be seen from Jetport's stop still CCTV security video other than the four frames. But before they reached that point, they were also witnessed by other travelers in the parking lot of Jetport. U.S. Airway ticket agent Michael Tuhey, who had checked in Atta and Alamari, has repeatedly said in interviews, So he says, I need to see your IDs. And uh, he sort of flips up a license, you know. And I, I just got a very bad vibe. I'm saying, if this guy don't look like an Arab terrorist, nobody does. And then I gave myself a political, a PC slap, you know. Of course, for Tuhei, being the only airport employee publicly accredited to witnessing and checking in Atta before boarding a flight that morning with Alamari, still played him with sleepless nights for years. The bag-handling employees from Logan later publicly confessed to handling the luggage left over that's said to belong to Ada, but no American Airlines ticket agent at Logan has ever come forth to having eye-to-eye -eye contact checking in Ata or Alamari. But in 2005, Michael Tuhey appeared on Oprah, revealing his distraught feelings of guilt and another layer of it when he learned that not long after, a ticket agent at Boston Logan who had checked in some of the hijackers had committed suicide as a result of failing to detect them, feeling guilty for checking them in, giving them the clearance to board their flights. But having gone past the U.S. Airways ticket counter at Jetport, Atta and Alamari board this U.S. Airways Colgan commuter flight 5930, 
910 The Final Hours also interviewed two of the passengers, Brian Garrett and Roger Quiron, who also flew with Atta and Alamari to Logan. And for the first time, it actually showed a copy of Flight 5930's manifest, which has never been released publicly, which only eight passengers were flying on the 19-seater commuter plane. But if you take notice of the list of eight passengers, the first two listed are Brian Garrett and Roger Quiron. Atta and Alamari are listed as numbers 6 and 8. But through other research, Vincent Meisner, an engineer for Honeywell Corp, on his way to San Jose, is likely number four that's redacted, blurred out. Jane Eisenberg of Cape Elizabeth, Maine, is likely number seven that's in between Anta and Alomari. But seat numbers three and five are also redacted. Who were the other two passengers, and why hasn't the flight manifest been released in the first place? Could it have to do with other hijacking operatives that were accompanying them? Extra operatives crossing over through Canada into Maine could have took an earlier flight from Jetport, Maine, before Atta and Alamari took theirs the next morning after 5.45 a.m. And even if there wasn't anybody else with them on Flight 530, those unaccounted for suspects who may have still been in their presence while in Portland could have simply taken another charter flight from Jetport at the same time, or as the possibility that at least two suspects could have simply joined them on commuter flight 5930, as pointed out with the flight manifest shown on 910 the final hours of flight 9530, at least two names are undetermined. But this fiasco throughout the state of Maine prior to 9-11 isn't the only Canadian connection attributed to Mohammed Atta. And strangely enough, the story doesn't end there with some of the passengers on flight 5930 from Jetport. 